Okay, we're going to start with an interesting stat. So since the beginning of agriculture, the world population has increased by a thousandfold from roughly 7 million back then to about 7.5 billion today. And I think as soon as people hear this stat, or just even think about how many people are in the world overall, they have this immediate sense of dread where it's like, well, that's the issue, right? There's just way too many people. There's only this one earth. There's no way that we're gonna figure out how to be sustainable like this. I'd like to try to reframe this a little bit for everybody. So it turns out if, if you were to measure the biomass of all human beings, so you took the 7.5 billion people, put them all together, the biomass of all of humanity is about 350 million tons. And it turns out that if you measure the biomass of all the ants on the planet, put them all together, figure out that mass, it is also about 350 million tons. So that's a pretty cool just trivia fact. But one different thing between humans and ants is that ants, uh, humans eat roughly 3% of their body weight per day. And ants eat about 30% of their body weight per day. And what that means when you multiply it out is that ants actually eat 10 times more. They consume 10 times of the, more of the earth in terms of what they eat every single day compared to humanity. But we don't have news reports where we say, oh my gosh, it's all those ants. If there wasn't so many freaking ants eating 10 times more than us, we would have a chance at making a sustainable planet. Because, you know, surprise news flashes, it's actually not the amount. It's the style in which you consume it. Right? So even though ants eat 10 times more of the earth than us every single day, every single year, they do it in a style where they actually make the ecosystem healthier in the process. They aerate the soils, they recycle nutrients. You know, in short, ants basically create more ecosystem services than they consume, even though they consume 10 times more than us. And us, you know, as great as we think we are, we're consuming 10 times less than that, but we somehow do it in such a poisonous style that it threatens uh, a lot of other life on Earth. And ergo, you know, it brings us to the question of how do we become a little bit more like ants and really like all of life? Because the thing that, this rule that ants are following of creating more ecosystem services than ecosystem consumption is actually a rule that's followed by all of life right now except for ourselves. So the big question, how does humanity produce more ecosystem services than it consumes how does humanity, in other words, become a net positive to nature? Now, in order for us to understand that, let's look at where we are. So this has no projections. There's nothing about average temperature in the year 2100 or you know, the climate destabilization. This is just stuff that already happened. There's no debate to be had. If you ask the oil and gas companies, they will give you the same numbers as to what's already happened. So starting back on the left-hand side of the graph, in the year 1750, before the Industrial Revolution, we had a certain amount of carbon in the atmosphere, uh, 280 parts per million. And through the use of coal, oil, gas, cement, just kind of reading left to right, uh, you know, using some cement, uh, doing land use changes, we have effectively added a huge amount of carbon into the atmosphere. And actually, and everything on the left-hand side is human activities. And if that's all we did, and nature didn't try to help us out at all, we would already be up at 570 parts per million. So just completely blowing past. Everybody remembers 350.org, right? Anyway, we'd be totally screwed in a way that would be just fully implausible that we, could, that we could pull out of it in any reasonable time frame. But luckily, we were not alone. While we were doing all of this, actually over on the left-hand side is the way that the ecosystem responded. So the ocean has already pulled down 582 gigatons of carbon dioxide. The land has pulled down almost 650 gigatons of carbon dioxide into soils, into trees, into wetlands. And then the rest is still up in the atmosphere. The rest is still floating there, which is why, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we've moved from 280 parts per million up to 409, 410, 411, that kind of territory. And what that represents is a trillion tons of mass that is in the wrong place. There's a trillion tons of carbon dioxide that is up in the atmosphere that was not there before the Industrial Revolution. And we should ask ourselves the question, if we want to become, uh, if we want to become net positive nature, how do we go pay off our debts? How do we pay down the trillion tons? It's also worth noting that even if we had no more emissions from this day on, even if we solved all of our emission issues, we'd still have a trillion ton debt to pay. Now, in order to go understand how we would approach that, um, very briefly, I was one of the 
the founding team members of Google X. I worked on a Google Glass, self-driving car, Project Loon, all the different things there, whatever. But, the, uh, <laughs> but a thing that I learned that was really interesting from that group was the idea of an invention catalyst. Because there's a type of invention that if you go and change it, it's not just a better mousetrap. It's not just the mousetrap 20% faster or 10% cheaper. It's, it's a thing that both improves the invention and has the potential to completely reset the entire ecosystem around it. And one such invention catalyst that we worked on was the self-driving car. Because we, we recognized, even in the early days of the group, that cars had an average utilization of about 4%. So everybody that owns a car, you know, you only drive it about 4% of the time. 96% of the time, it's parked somewhere, sitting, providing no value to anybody. And if you could have you know, self-driving cars replace car ownership, and cars would basically show up as you needed them, you could move the utilization from maybe 4% to, let's say, 40%. That still leaves 60% of the time for refueling or recharging, maintenance, all these sorts of things. So I even think that's a little conservative, but if you could move, from 4% utilization to 40% utilization per car, actually, it means that you would roughly need about 10 times fewer cars. And imagine all the cities of the world if we could remove 80, 90% of the cars and have pretty comparable transportation utility. Like, even in the early days of the group, we used to joke that we would go around to all the, the cities of the world and find all the signs that say parking lot, and we'd erase the trailing letters to just say the word park. Because 30% of cities are used for parking space. Like, we could reclaim that for green spaces, community spaces, growing food, lots of things. And this is what an invention catalyst does. Not only does it, it change what a car is or does it change what the object is, it has the potential to completely reset what you can imagine for the entire system. Now, let's take the idea of the invention catalyst and let's try to apply it toward the question of how does humanity become a net positive to nature. And with that, let me introduce one of the invention catalysts that I'm investing in relative to this, but I actually recently launched a venture firm where we've already invested in 15 of these, but we're just gonna run through one because uh, we got almost no time now. So this is basically a, a set of drones, and each one of these drones is able to plant 120 trees per minute at one-tenth the cost that it currently costs to plant a tree. And you can see the CEOs in the middle slide, that's Susan, over on the right-hand side is Irina, who's, who's uh, like, uh, like cradling a mangrove that we planted in southern Myanmar. We've planted over 10 million so far. And if you are able to go plant 120 trees per minute per drone, it roughs out to uh, 25 drones being able to plant a million trees in five hours. Now, what could you do with that sort of, of invention? Like, what's the, catalyst, the catalytic potential of it? Well, it turns out that trees weigh, by the time they grow to maturity, tra trees weigh between two to 20 tons. And trees, on average, are about 50% carbon by mass. Depends on cellulose versus lignin content, but it doesn't matter. It all centered us roughly around 50%. And what that means is if you see a mature tree and it weighs between 2 to 20 tons, it actually represents 1 to 10 tons of carbon. And all of that carbon came from the air. Actually, almost the entire mass of a tree and almost all plants comes from the air. 95 plus percent of the mass of a tree comes from from the air, so trees are effectively crystallized air. And actually, if trees got their mass from the soil, you'd have a tree-sized hole under every tree, but you don't, because it's crystallized air. Now, what, what does this all have to do with anything? Well, if you could plant a trillion trees that weighed two tons each, that would represent one trillion tons of carbon, which is exactly the size of the debt that we need to pay off in order to return the atmosphere, not to two degrees C warming, warming or 1.5 C degree warming, but to the place it was before the Industrial Revolution. Like, we should aim to go, yes, you can clap for that. Like, we should not make our vision just different layers, levels of tragedy. Because there's a five degree C tragedy and there's a two degree C tra tragedy, and 1.5 C is also a tragedy. Like, we should actually, if we're gonna put in all this effort and work, Let's just aim for something that is worth going for, like an actual healthy planet. Even if it takes longer, let's set the goals at the things that, that we can truly believe in. Anyhow, let's say you wanted to plant a trillion trees, and your plan to go do it was to, to do 20 billion trees per year at, uh, for 50 years. That adds up to a trillion. Then even with our current tech, which we can still optimize quite a bit more, that would only take 9,000 drones 
and 450 planting staff. There's a lot of folks that can help tend the trees, so a lot of jobs will be created after the planting is done. But it would take 9,000 drones, 450 planting staff, and only about $80 million a year in operations to put down 20 billion trees per year. This is a thing where you can begin reimagining the way that the future turns out. It's not us struggling and, and fighting each other Mad Max style or, you know, whatever. It's kind of funny and terrible. But, like, but actually, even the biggest leaders in the world talk about those scenarios. They're, they're not creating that possibility. And it's because they can't yet. It's like we need the people like you in the room to be able to create these invention catalysts so people can begin to imagine it differently. Right now, they're imagining with what is within the scope of what they know to be possible. And what technology allows us to do is make things impossible that, uh, make things possible that for forever we thought was impossible. And it turns out, like I mentioned before, this was not the, the only invention catalyst. I, I'm just launching a venture firm right now. We just got to first close. So anyway, there's still room if you want to get in there for final close, but whatever. Separate topic. <laughs> and we've already invested in about 15 of these because we need to not just fix the atmosphere, we need to redo the way we do agriculture so we don't burn down the rainforest. Like people think that it's these terrible timber companies cutting down the rainforest. We, we only lose a couple percent of the rainforest for timber. We actually mostly burn it down to go plant soybeans and graze cattle. So really the rainforest is being cut down for food production. So we absolutely need to change the way we need to do food production, material production, all these sorts of things. We need invention catalysts that allow us to reimagine a different future for all of these places. And being a person who's invested in and had the privilege of being able to work directly with these teams, honestly, these skills are no different than the skills that my teams practiced at Google, Yahoo, all the regular technology companies. These are just normal technology skills, but pointed at things that might be catalysts for a different sort of future. So with that, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. If you want to watch the longer talk, you could go there. And that's it. Ta-da. All right. That's it? Okay.